Okay, we'll uh, get the uh, the session rolling tonight. Um, so thank you all for uh, dialing in tonight to the next episode of uh, the 2023 State of Play series. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, you probably saw a notification about the meeting being recorded. Please just click OK or agree to continue. Um, and then firstly, an acknowledgement of country. So MND Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people on whose land I am and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend a welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on this call today. Um, so tonight we'll hear about different aspects of the journey to develop new treatments. We're going to hear from uh, Rita uh, Mazzini from the Perrin Institute in Perth. We'll talk about a treatment which is in the, the very early uh, stages of development, which uh, kind of matches Rita's career a bit since she only finished a PhD last year. So um uh and she uh, won a grant from us in her first year of a post phd which is a fantastic effort so i'm really looking forward to hearing about um what treatments you're working on and then we have someone in a, a slightly different stage of his uh, career um professor brad turner from the florey institute in melbourne and he can tell us uh with a bit of more of a holistic um uh, journey taking us through uh, a, a treatment which he's taken right through through to clinical trial phase of development. So looking forward to both those talks. As previously, um, each presenter will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a combined Q&A at the end of the session. So please submit your questions through the chat or the Q&A function if you're on Zoom and if you're on Facebook, um, you can submit uh, questions through the comments. Um, and you don't need to wait to the end, just fire your comments on, uh, your questions or comments as they come to you and we'll collate them and then ask them at the end during the joint Q&A. And um, uh, there's no stupid questions. So anything you think you don't understand or want to know more about, please ask and we will um, do our best to answer those questions. So I think uh, Rita's going first. So um, please take it away, Rita, and share your screen. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Hi everybody. Um, so I just want to first make sure my sheen, screen's shared right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so first I'd like to th thank the organizers for giving me the chance to talk today. Um, today I'm going to be mostly talking about um, a project that I've been working on that was given fund funding this year by MND uh, Research Australia. Um, so the title of my talk is there on screen, Allele Selective Fuzz Targeted Antisense Oligonucleotide Therapeutic Development ALS. Um, so hopefully if that doesn't make too much sense at the moment, it will by the end of my talk. Uh, I'll just give you a bit of background about myself. Um, so I'm a researcher at uh, Murdoch University in Perth at the Centre for Molecular Medicine and Innovative Therapeutics, uh, which we just call CMIT. Um, so at CMIT, we focus on developing therapeutics um, for various conditions, but uh, we have a strong focus on development of um, RNA-based medicine and gene therapies, um, and also a strong uh, focus on precision um, and personalised medicine, even down to the level of... Um, medicines being tailored to a specific patient. Um, also part of uh, that motor neuron disease research group at the Parent Institute in Perth, um, and they focus on um, research into neurological conditions. Um, so where my research comes in is kind of the intersection between these two uh, in developing gene therapies for motor neuron disease. Um, so yeah, I completed my PhD last year working on um, developing some potential therapeutics for ALS, um, but today I'll be focusing um, on that specific project that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so just jump straight into it. So what is fuzz? Um, so fuzz is a gene that codes for a protein also called fuzz. Um, so I'll just give a quick refresher on the basics of how genes work. Um, so a gene is a code that gives instructions for making a particular protein. Um, each gene just being a small segment of a total DNA strand. Uh, so the instructions for the gene are copied to get to the RNA. Um, thousands of copies are made of the RNA for each um, gene in each cell, kind of like photocopying a page of a book. Um, and then the protein is made from the instructions in the RNA. Uh, so basically there's cellular, cellular machinery in every cell that can read the RNA code and can add the right amino acids to the protein chain. Um, so what does the fuzz protein actually do? 
Well, it has several different functions in the cell. Um, it's involved in repairing any DNA damage that may occur. Um, it's also involved in um, the expression of other genes. So it's an RNA binding protein, meaning that it binds to the RNA of other genes and affects their expression. Um, and it's also involved in um, different cellular responses to stress. Um, so things like exposure to toxins, extreme conditions, um, and mechanical damage and things like that. Okay, so about 5% of familial ALS and about 1% of sporadic ALS is caused by um, pathogenic variations, also called mutations, in the fuzz gene. Um, it's also associated with juvenile ALS with some patients as young as 11 years old. Um, so what, when we say there's a pathogenic variant or mutation, what does it actually mean? So the DNA is made up of four different bases that we abbreviate to A, G, C, and T. Um, and these are decoded in sets of three to uh, give instructions on which amino acid should be added to the protein next. So just a single base change can mean that a wrong amino acid is placed in the chain, and this can affect the function of the protein. Um, so there are obviously other types of genetic variation as well, but in the case of fuzz ALS, it's usually just caused by a one base change in the, in the code. Um, so just a quick reminder of how, of how the cell's structured. So you've got the nucleus in the center of the cell and the cytoplasm surrounding it. And fuzz has roles in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm, but um, is primarily localized in the nucleus most of the time. Um, and the most common fuzz mutations uh, that lead to ALS occur in the protein's nuclear localization signal. Um, so this is the part of the protein that helps it move back into the nucleus from the cytoplasm. And the mutations disrupt this and prevent fuzz from being able to shuttle back uh, into the nucleus effectively. So this can lead to a buildup of fuzz protein in, in the cytoplasm, as you can see in the image on the right there, rather than um, being in the nucleus as, as it usually is. Um, so these fuzz aggregates um, are thought to be toxic to cells, but as well as this, it also means that they can't carry out their normal functions um, in the nucleus, such as regulating expression of other genes and responding to um, cellular stress and DNA damage. Okay, so that was the background on fuzz. Um, now I'll give a quick introduction to what antisense oligonucleotides are. Uh, we usually just refer to these as AOs, which is a lot quicker. Um, so AOs are short, single-stranded nucleic acids, uh, usually made up of DNA or RNA-like bases, but with some chemical modifications to them as well. Um, they're usually around 20 to 25 bases long, and they work by directly binding to the RNA of their target gene. So interest in AOs is, is becoming a lot more widespread in recent years as an alternative to um, small molecule-based medicines. Um, once bound to their target RNA, the AOs can affect the expression of the gene in um, several different ways. So sometimes that can be used to reduce expression of a gene, sometimes to increase the expression, or to affect the structure of the protein in a different way through um, alternative splicing. And so there, there are a growing number of AOs that are on the, currently on the market. There are three that treat uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Those were developed by Professor Sue Fletcher and Professor Steve Wilton, who we work with at um, the Parent Institute and CMIT. Uh, there's another one to treat spinal muscular atrophy, and there are various um, other ones to treat uh, conditions that are, are mostly, mostly targeted to the liver. So um, as you probably be aware, there are also some clinical trials underway for AOs to treat SOD1 ALS as well as fuzz ALS. And also a couple of um, trials for AOs to treat sporadic ALS, um, which are targeted to the STM and 2 gene and the ATAX and 2 gene. So um, all these drugs, while they all target the RNA directly, they actually vary uh, significantly in their mechanism of action. So the drug targeted to uh, STM and 2 increases its expression, um, while the ones targeted to SOD1 and FUS both aim to decrease their expression. Okay, so I'm just going to go a little bit into the background of how, how this is done. So I won't tell you about all the different mechanisms because that would take way too long, but um, I will explain one of the mechanisms. And this is one that's commonly used uh, to achieve a protein um, reduction. So this is the mechanism that both tofersin for SOD1 ALS and ion363 for fuzz ALS use. All right, so in every cell, um, in almost every organism, there's an enzyme called RNAs H. Um, so RNAs H is able to recognize when there's DNA and RNA that are hybridized to each other and degrades the RNA strand. Um, so we can take advantage of this mechanism when designing our AOs. Uh, these types of AOs are called Gapmas. Um, you can see a, a schematic at the bottom of the uh, screen there of the structure of them. 
So the ends of the areas are what we call the wings. Um, they're made up of RNA-like bases. Um, and the wings are usually chemically modified to increase their stability, give them resistance from nucleases and increase their binding affinity to their target. Um, then in the middle of the uh, AO, there's what we refer to as the gap, and that part is made up of DNA bases. So when the AO binds to its target RNA, RNAs H can recognize the segment where the DNA in the middle of the AO is bound to the RNA and, can, and then will degrade the RNA transcript. So then after that, the AO is freed uh, to bind to another transcript. So in, this is the way it reduces the RNA and then reduces the protein that's produced. Uh, so the good news is there is a, is a fuzz targeted AO that was granted expanded act access and is already in clinical trials. Um, this is a GAPMA type AO, so the transcripts are degraded by RNAs H. Um, it has methoxyethyl or MO modifications on the ends. Um, this is one of the most widely used modifications, and it's also used in tofersin for um, SOD1 ALS. Um, so far, the results have only been published for the very first patient, and that's in this Nature Medicine paper that, that I've got on the screen there. Um, and although that patient has sadly passed, passed away, she did show some uh, improvement in her ALS FRS score. Um, it, did, uh, it did not improve, but it, it was it, uh, it, it didn't increase as fast as it had been before. But it was important to note that this patient had very severe disease at um, the onset of um, the treatment. So she was already uh, requiring ventilatory support at that stage. But uh, there was also another patient that you might have heard of who um, her story has been um, online and she also had been taking this same drug and she showed some very promising uh, promising signs. This patient was only 15 years old at diagnosis. So um, there is good reason to be hopeful that this drug could really be beneficial for those ALS patients, which might lead you to the question, why am I developing an AO to treat fuzz ALS when there's already one undergoing clinical trial? So the reason for that is I believe that there may be a way to improve on the current um, AO that is like undergoing clinical trial. And this is where the allele selective part uh, comes in. So I'll just give a little bit of background on that. So as I'm sure you're all aware, we all have two copies of every gene, one inherited from each parent. Um, for recessive genetic diseases, you need two bad copies of the gene to be affected by the disease. But for fuzz ALS, it's a dominant disease, which means that you only need one bad copy of the gene to be affected by the disease. So this means that only 50% of the fuzz protein that um, are that the patients are producing will be affected by the mutation and, and um, the toxic ag uh, aggregation, whereas the other half will be normal protein, although it can also be involved, but um, yeah, it doesn't have it, uh, that mutation there. So current therapies reduce expression of all fuzz proteins, both the toxic and the normal copies. Um, so because fuzz ALS is such an aggressive disease, it's likely that there will still be a net benefit for patient, patients by reducing the expression of the total fuzz protein to reduce the toxic um, aggregations but the longer term effects of knocking down fuzz in humans is not known. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it has important roles to play in neurons. Um, and my hope is that by uh, allowing as much normal, normal expression of the protein as possible, it will be able to reduce any um, uh, side effects of, of the medication. So this leads to the question, can I reduce expression of fuzz that contains the pathogenic variant and leave the other copy intact to produce the normal protein? Um, so the way that we would achieve, achieve this, um, so first I'll just give a quick quick refresher on base pairing. So when the uh, nucle nucleic acids bind to each other, the A's always um, partner up with the T's and the G's always partner up with the C's. So if there's a mismatch in the, in the um, code, this decreases the affinity of the nucleic acids for each other and, and can lead to bulges. So we can target our AOs to a particular uh, region of RNA by, um, by using bases in the AO that are uh, complementary to the region that we want to target. And so what we can do is target AOs to a site where there's variation between the two alleles. So we can design the AO to be completely complementary to the allele that we want to reduce the expression of and leave a mismatch between the AO and the RNA for the allele that we want to keep. Um, so then the question was, will a one base mismatch reduce the AO binding affinity or the RNA's H activity enough towards the non-target allele to allow the normal allele to be expressed while still reducing the expression of our, um, our target allele. Um, and the other thing to note here is that there are over 50 different fuzz mutations that can lead to ALS. So each one is uh, exceedingly rare. So it uh, would not be economically feasible um, for drug companies to be developing allele selective ones for each different mutation. So this was also another challenge that needed to be overcome. And that's where these common variants come in. 
So what are common variants? Um, so common variants are genetic variations that occur in the population that are benign. So unlike the mutations, common variants don't usually cause any ill effects. Um, they're usually just a one base change that doesn't uh, lead to any amino acid change in the protein. Um, and some of them can actually be really very common. So that means at that position, there'll be two different bases that you could possibly have. So if you have the same base on each allele, then you'll be homozygous. And if you've got um, a different variant on each allele, you'll be heterozygous. Um, so in order to overcome the problem of the many different fuzz variants that exist, rather than designing my AOs to target the pathogenic fuzz mutations, I've decided to instead target my AOs to common variants. Um, so this is how it would work. So I've picked two common variants in the fuzz gene and I'm um, developing AOs, one to target each allele of each of the two different variants. Um, you can see in, in the bottom corner there are schematics. So I'll have a, uh, basically a set of AOs that we can that we can um, draw from when, when we want to treat a patient. Um, so a patient will need to have their uh, DNA sequence to determine if they're actually heterozygous at either of the common variants, and also to determine which allele their pathogenic variant is on in relation to their common variant. Um, so to be for this treatment to be applicable, they will need to be heterozygous at at least one of the common variants, and that covers about uh, around 60% of the population. Um, so then if they were heterozygous, we could select an AO for the patient that uh, reduces the expression of the allele that also just ha happens to contain their pathogenic variant as well. Um, so for example, if we pretend that this diagram represents the RNA of a patient, they might be heterozy uh, heterozygous at common variant two. Um, and if their fuzz allele is uh, mutant allele is found to be an allele two, we would select the red AO for the patient. And this would be completely com complementary to the um, allele that we want to target and have a one base mismatch to the allele that we don't want to target. Um, so this mismatch would mean that the AO doesn't bind as well to this transcript and RNAs H won't be able to work as well. So if the pathogenic variant happened to be on the other allele, then we would just select a different um, AO from, for that patient instead. So using this strategy, um, we only need to develop a few AOs to be able to treat um, most of the patients, irrespective of which of the 50 different variants they carry. Um, so some of the different parameters that I've been testing include which target sites to use, um, where is the best place to have the mismatch within the AO. Um, also, can you achieve better allele selectivity by adding an extra mismatch? So this would mean that the AO would have one mismatch to the target allele and two mismatches to the non-target allele. Um, also, what are the best chemical modifications to use in the wings of the AO? And also um, looking at how the length and the gap length affects the selectivity and the activity. And so finally, some results. Um, so here's some results from a couple of the lead AOs that um, I've got. So this data comes from transfecting um, human fibroblast cells in culture, incubating for three days, then extracting the RNA from the cells and analyzing it. Um, this is the result from three replicate experiments and is showing the fuzz expression levels um, compared to the levels in untreated cells. Uh, so the most promising results I've gotten come from using a relatively new type of chemical modification in the wings of the AO. So you can see in the first graph, I've compared the expression of um, each allele when using the MO modified uh, wings in the AO. So that's the one that a lot of um, current AOs use. Um, and then also testing this new chemical modification. So at the lowest concentration, which was 10 nanomolar, uh, the target, the non-target allele, which is allele 2, um, was um, not reduced compared to untreated cells when using either of those, those AOs. Whereas at this concentration, the target allele was reduced down to about 39% using the MO-modified AO and down to about 18.5% using the new chemical modification. And we had a similar result um, for AOs targeted to the other common variant on the other allele. Um, so how does this compare to the ION363 sequence? So they've published that sequence and its chemistry. So I'm able to have that synthesized to do direct comparisons. So um, at 25 nanomolar, the ION363 sequence reduced expression of both fuzz alleles to about 8.5% of levels in untreated cells. And you can see in the red box on the left there that um, the CV1B AO also reduced expression of allele 1 to about 8.5%, while allele 2 was uh, remaining at about 59%. Um, so if you just decrease the concentration of the AO a little bit, you can get to a point where you don't really reduce expression at all of the non-target allele, whereas the target allele is reduced down to around um, just under 20%. Um, so 
This means that patients will be able to benefit from having expression of the normal FOS protein while still greatly reducing expression of the toxic FOS protein. So hopefully this uh, um, treatment uh, can help with um, reducing any side effects of the drugs and uh, be better in the, for long-term use. So other, this work's still ongoing. Um, so other things that I've been looking at is cytotoxicity. Everything's looking good there so far. Um, also looking at non-specific protein binding, um, and that's looking pretty good as well. Um, also looking at hybridization dependent off-target effects. So that just means um, whether the AOs will bind to and reduce expressions of other genes that we're not trying to target that ha might have a similar sequence to the target regions. And I'm also looking at how we can reduce this um, as much as possible by changing the AO design parameters. Um, so once I've finished all that, I should have my lead AO molecules. The next step after that will be to test them in motor neurons grown from patient cells. Um, so cell samples um, that have been converted into stem, stem cells and then converted into motor neurons. Uh, and in those cells, we'll be able to determine the effect on phase aggregation, toxicity, and or any other pathways affected by the disease. So I'm planning to take uh, what I've learned in this project to also develop a little selective AOs to treat um, other no uh, dominant neurological diseases and maybe possibly even other genetic forms of ALS as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd just like to thank some of my colleagues in the MND uh, research group at the Perrin and at CMET at Murdoch University. Here's a pic of us uh, at the MND ball a few weeks ago. We're hiding in the back there somewhere. Um, and also like to acknowledge our funders, especially MND Australia, that awarded me an innovator grant to be able to continue working on this project. And also the Jamelli Family Foundation, who have been supporters of the MND research group at the Perrin since we began. And that's it from me. Thank you. Um, yeah, now I'll be passing over to uh, Professor Bradley Turner, who'll be telling you about some of his work. Great, thanks, uh, Rita. And I'll just... get my presentation started. So... Can you see that okay? Yep. Great, thank you. All right, so I'm going to follow on from radar. And what we just heard was a great example of a, a precision uh, genetic medicine approach for MND. And that's, that's um, tailored to a, a specific genetic defect um, responsible for MND. So what I'm going to do now is sort of flip the story and talk about using um, generic medicines um, uh, to, to treat um, motor neuron disease. And it's really a tale about taking a generic drug called um, Ambroxol all the way through from the lab bench to, to the clinic. So this is what we call from bench to bedside. Just bear with me. Okay, so I thought I, what I might do is just review the state of play, if you like, of the approved drugs for MND currently. And what we do know is it's been almost 30 years since Rilazole or Rilatec was approved for, for MND. And we know that this effect, this has a quite a modest effect on uh, lifespan of survival of patients. And this is a drug which can treat all forms of MND. And yes, it was TGA approved nearly 30 years ago. So then it took a while, but then um, the second drug that was FDA approved for MND was Aderivone. So this is um, an antioxidant given intravenously, although there now is an oral formulation in development. And I think uh, this was approved about six years ago, but real world experience, especially coming from Europe, is telling us that the effect of this drug on, on uh, the disease is quite, quite modest. And um, this is a drug which can treat all forms of MND, and it has not been um, properly TGA approved in Australia. Now, most recently, there was a drug approval uh, for a, a drug combination called Relivrio from a company called Amelix. So that was approved um, late last year. And, and this is a drug which, um, again, we don't have a lot of real world experience on its use, but it may extend um, lifespan by about six months in patients. It's targeted at all forms of motor neuron disease, and it's yet to be TGA approved. And most recently, so last um, April this year, 
and Rita gave us a great introduction to this. There was a genetic precision medicine called Tefersen, uh, which was FDA approved. Tefersen, um, certainly in the, the phase three trial, it showed quite um, dramatic effects on, on um, survival of patients, so potentially up to 18 months. But again, we like real world data on that. And this is a, a precision medicine, so it only targets MND patients that carry a defect in the SOD1 gene. So this is about 2%, and it is yet to be TGA approved. So there's, there's the state of play of um, drugs. And clearly what you can see from this is we, we need more drugs and we need more effective drugs uh, for, for MND, whether it's um, the genetic forms or, or the sporadic form. Now, it's not for the lack of trying. So what I've got here is um, this is a, a, a map of clinical trials in MND. This is quite a few years old now. And you can see that this is a very crowded space. Um, they, they, at any one time, there are hundreds of clinical trials ongoing worldwide in MND. And what you're looking at here is um, this is a, a ALS compared to FTD. So very little activity in the, in the FTD frontotemporal dementia space, but a lot of activity in ALS. And these are all candidate drugs. Which are new, and the idea is you've got different phases of these trials and you want to hit this bullseye, which is um, get, get to approval. What is reassuring is that three of these drugs have now been FDA approved. And I mentioned um, earlier, so MCI 186 is a Derivine, so that's now um, FDA approved. Uh, Relivrio, at least one component of Relivrio called Tudcar is, is approved in that formulation and the SOD1 ASO to first and is um, FDA approved. So when we think about clinical trials, uh, we think about uh, usually th three stages, three phases. So a lot of the lab work that Rita spoke about and I'll get into shortly, uh, that, that's the preclinical phase. So this is the, the laboratory phase, the testing, and then we initiate um, phase one safety trials and pending positive um, well, data, we can then progress to a phase two, which is really looking at um, dosing, trying to find the effective dose of the drug, and then a phase three, which is a, a large scale, usually international trial looking at efficacy. And if all goes well, you get the stamp of approval and then you can, um, the, the, drug, the drug gets marketed. Now there is an, another phase called phase four, and this is a post um, approval um, observation phase. It's never straightforward in um, MND, so we do know that there are exceptions to this um, progression. And, you know, this timeline normally takes a good 10, 15 years um, at, at best. And we know that Relivrio was approved based on phase two data. And now that will, um, that's gone out, and I think there's a phase three trial which is ongoing. So there are ways that you can um, shortcut this process. I did want to point out um, two uh innovations if you like in this space so the first is what we've seen recently is um, a lot of development of humanized or human models and these models can be stem cells called ipscs they can be three-dimensional uh, miniature brains called organoids or you can even integrate organs with digital technology organ on chip so there's a real push at the moment in research to embrace these type of humanized models and this allows you then to, um, to, to really speed up these trials and, and, and confirm safety in human systems to launch straight into phase two trials. The other method, which is relevant to my talk today, is using um, repurposing or repositioning drugs, which from the medicine cabinet. And these drugs are often have been around for decades. So they're, they're, they have excellent safety profiles and what you can do is repurpose them for MND. And this is taking generic drugs, bypassing safety trials and launching straight into effectiveness trials. I just wanted to mention there are other um, ways in which you can speed up this pipeline. So there's orphan drug status, which gives um, tax incentives to drug companies. And there's EAP expanded access program, which allows earlier access to experimental therapies prior to approval. I just wanted to refer, reflect quickly on why is drug development for MND um, so challenging. So I showed you that bullseye plot before, and out of those 50 or 100 so drugs, only three of them have been uh, approved in the last um, six years. 
And we do know that MN MND is uh, complex, and this is illustrated quite nicely here in this diagram from Pamela Shaw's group, that um, this is the motor neuron. We know that there are multiple chains of events that go wrong within the motor neuron. And it's just not the motor neuron that's affected. So we have it, the motor neuron is surrounded by inflammatory cells in the brain. And it also um, has interacts with muscle and there's a disruption of those connections. So you've got, um, this is this really tells you this is a multi, multi hit um, idea or hypothesis responsible for motor neuron disease. So it's not just not a single therapy or a single solution to this complex problem. The second point I'll make is that the, the cause or causes of MND are still largely unknown. So what we heard from Rita was a, a, a about FUS mutations, which comprise a portion of the genetic form of MND, um, which is 10% uh, overall. But mo the majority of cases of MND are, are seemingly random or out of the blue and 90%. And we really lack the ability to effectively model um, sporadic MND. What we do know about sporadic MND is that one of the signature pathologies is um, reflected through this protein called TDP43. And what we've got here are some, uh, these are images of motor neurons, which are showing accumulation, abnormal accumulation of TDP43 protein um, in these cells. And we do know that TDP43 protein uh, accumulation or pathology is an absolute signature of motor neuron disease in such that you see it in virtually all forms of MND with the exception of SOD1 and FUS. So therefore, from a, a preclinical or laboratory perspective engaged in drug development, it, it is therefore very important to incorporate TDP43 models in, in your um, translational pipeline. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So. Our lab took an interest in um, metabolism quite a few years ago, particularly in lipid metabolism. So lipids are the fatty molecules that encase our cells, and they're absolutely essential uh, for function in, in the brain and spinal cord. And there were really two publications that came out at the same time, one from a, a, a French team led by um, Jean-Philippe Lafleur and another paper from the States. And they pointed to a specific abnormality in, in a lipid um, class of lipids and pathways. So we thought, what is the relevance of these changes in lipids to TDP43 linked um, motor neuron disease? So what we did is our lab works with a model of TDP43 MND. And this is a, this is a mouse which carries um, a mutation in a human TDP43 gene. And these mice develop um, symptoms, so they become weak from about three months of age. And this is concurrent with the death of motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord. And then you get subsequent um, inflammation. So this was the model that we used. And we have a very talented um, postdoc in the group, Dr. Sophia Lu Kinga. And um, she, she conducted all of the experiments I'm about to tell you about uh, in this mouse model. And what we did was we performed a study in which we looked at we wanted to get a sense of what, what, is the, what is the snapshot of lipid changes in tissues from this mouse model. So what you're looking at here are different plots and I'll just draw your attention to this one on the right, the far right. So this, this is what we call a heat map of changes. So the green is a healthy mouse, the red is a, a TDP43 MND mouse. And what you can see is these colors respond to um, lipids, lipid abundance, which is, um, either gone up or down. And you can see that there's some profound uh, lipid changes. So we, we were able to generate a lipid signature from this. And this was true of spinal cords from these animals, but it was especially apparent in muscle. So when you take skeletal muscle from these animals, if you again look here at this um, heat map, you can see there is a complete rearrangement of lipid molecules in muscles from these TDP43 mice compared to healthy control mice. What stood out to us was a particular uh, defect in a, in a lipid pathway. So what you're looking at here is a, a snapshot of the part of the cell. And in particular, we saw that there was a, a, a rearrangement of lipids in this um, pathway. And there's a particular enzyme called GBA2. And there exists a inhibitor for GBA2, which is called ambroxyl. 
So this, this created a therapeutic opportunity for us. If we could block the function of this enzyme GBA2, we could um, therefore correct lipid metabolism in this mouse model of MND. So just briefly, Ambroxyl. Ambroxyl is a, a cough syrup. Um, it's it's a, a mucolytic agent. It breaks down mu mucus. So therefore, it's used for respiratory diseases. And I'll just point out that it's uh, been around for you know a good um, 40 years. It's approved in 70 countries. So this is a great example of a generic medicine with an excellent safety profile um, with decades of, of use. The mechanism of action, um, it's proposed to um, have multiple activities, but the one property that we were interested in exploiting and repurposing for MND was the fact that it inhibits or blocks the activity of this enzyme called GBA2. So therefore, we embarked upon some experiments to test the therapeutic potential of ambroxyl in MND models. And the first model we turned to in collaboration with um, Shuan No from University of Queensland was using stem cells derived from MND patients that carry a mutation in TDP43. And what you can do is you can transform these stem cells into motor neurons as shown here, looking down the microscope. And there's a lot of data on the screen, but I just wanted to show you that when we treated these cells with ambroxyl, we were able to um, improve their survival in the Petri dish. And we were also able to correct the TDP43 pathology that I mentioned earlier in my slides. So these cells um, show this accumulation of TDP43, which was attenuated by the treatment of ambroxyl. So this was really great evidence from a human system that ambroxyl may have um, therapeutic benefit for, for MND. What about the mouse model? So this is when we engaged in a, a long-term animal experiment where we took these TDP43 mice, which model MND, and we gave them ambroxyl in their drinking water. And what we did was we measured different um, functions of these mice over, it was a 10 month experiment. So, um, and what we do in our group is we have different measures of motor function in these uh, mice. So we've got running wheels, we've got locomotor cells, we can test their muscle strength, look at their gait patterns. And at the end of the study, we take out their brains and tissues and look at the pathology and the lipids. So what did we see? Well, if we look here, this is a graph showing you um, the, the motor performance or function of these mice over time. The, the white squares here represent a, a normal mouse. So as you can see, it's able to maintain um, running distance on, on this apparatus. However, the TDP43 mouse shows a severe motor deficit, which gets progressively worse. When these mice were treated chronically with ambroxyl in their drinking water, we were able to um, improve that motor deficit. So, with, so you can see that the, the, the group here in the red, these are the mice treated with ambroxyl. There's, so there's an improvement in locomotion. And this was also true using a second test of motor function. And this is a locomotor cell. So here we're just comparing, this is the um, untreated group, the vehicle treated group compared to the ambroxyl treated group. So there's an improvement in locomotion using multiple tests of motor function. This was also true of gait analysis. So again, lots of graphs here, but if I just draw your attention maybe to this one using stride. So this measures the stride distance between the paws of the animals. And you can see here that the TDP43 mice, they have a longer stride uh, and this is reduced by treatment with ambroxyl, which is uh, a benefit. It's indicating benefit in this animal. What did we see pathologically in these mice? So what we did here was we, we analyzed the motor neuron pathology in the spinal cords of these mice. And if we just, um, and we were able to count individual motor neurons, if we look at this graph here, we can see that the TDP43 group in black lose their motor neurons compared to a healthy, um, what we call a wild type control. And then Broxel is able to pre preserve and protect those motor neurons from loss. We then began to wonder what, how was ambroxyl working in, in these mice? Was it due to an anti-inflammatory effect? And what we did here is we're able to label, label different inflammatory cells in the spinal cords of these animals. And if I cut to the chase, the answer is no. So ambroxyl is not having anti-inflammatory action in this mouse model. The second question we have is does ambroxyl promote a 
protective process called um, autophagy, which is a self-cleansing process that the brain uses. And again, lots of graphs here, but we've got really no change in this pathway. What I'm excited to tell you about was when we analyze the muscles from these treated mice, so we're looking at this component here, what you're looking at here is the connection between the, the motor neuron with the muscle. And we're able to reveal this using a, a red stain. And what you can see here is this is a well type animal, which has got um, a connection to the muscle. And this is completely lost and disrupted in the TDP43 mouse model. However, TDP43 mice treated with Ambroxyl were able to show stabilization of this connection to muscle. So we think that this is the mechanism of action for Ambroxyl. It is having what we would call a, a pro neuromuscular effect. It is, it is strengthening these um, important connections between the brain and the muscle, which get disrupted in MND. Uh, this is just a little bit more data showing the effects on the lipid signatures. So Ambroxyl was able to um, restore some of those lipid signatures. I just wanted to get to this point and tell you that we, we worked on this um, extensively for years and we were able to put together a preclinical package that we then took to our funding body, which is FIDMND, in order to um, su generate support for a clinical trial. So what I've shown you today is evidence in a TDP43 mouse model, but we did have evidence in also the SOD1 and another model called CHIMP2B. So we've got independent validation that Ambroxyl works in three very different mouse models of MND, in addition to Petri dish models. Based on this, um, FODMND were able to fund a, a phase two clinical trial of Ambroxyl for MND. And this is the study group here um, and the various members. And I'll just point out that this is an investigator driven, double blind, randomized, placebo controlled phase two trial. So this is what we call a gold standard trial for MND. This is the clinicaltrials.gov registration number. And the primary objective of this trial is to assess the long-term safety, tolerability and effectiveness of Ambroxyl given orally in the treatment of MND. And this will be achieved by using um, standard functional measures and also what we call um, electrical function tests in patients. We do have some secondary objectives and that is we would like to um, look at what we call target engagement of Ambroxyl in blood. So in other words, can we show that Ambroxyl is, um, is working in the way intended? And we're also going to look at different markers of um, drug, drug activity in blood. So what I wanted to do um, in, in the closing minutes that I've got is just talk about this trial. This trial um, commenced uh, formally two months ago. Patients um, have already been recruited and enrolled across five different sites in Australia. This trial uh, is open to 50 uh, participants, so people with MND. And we have two sites in Sydney, uh, one site in Victoria, one site in Adelaide, and one site in Launceston. Each site aiming to recruit up to 10 uh, participants. This just gives you an overview of the uh, patient recruitment. So patients that will be pre-screened, and there are eligibility criteria which are set by the uh, neurologists um, coordinating each of the sites. And these criteria um, do involve things such as um, functional rating scores and lung function capacity. And in the end, 50 patients will be evaluated for eligibility. They'll under, undergo these baseline assessments. And this is what we call a two to one randomization uh, of where uh, uh, one third of patients will be assigned the placebo solution and two thirds of the patients will be given the active drug, which is an ambroxyl solution. We're following a dose escalation protocol, which was used um, in a phase two trial in Parkinson's disease. So this was a trial conducted in the UK. And the hope is that patients will be able to reach their maximum dose by week five, which is uh, over just about a gram of ambroxyl per day. So this is taken daily. Um, and this is the trial design. So this, this is a, a six month uh, study in which the first month um, there'll be patient screening and recruitment, and then there'll be a dose escalation phase to reach maximum dose. And then patients um, will undergo 
assessments at weeks um, at baseline, weeks four, eight, 16, and 24. And I mentioned these earlier, these are our primary outcomes. So this is time to event. So we'll be looking at survival. We'll be looking at the um, placement of a, of a feeding tube and also the use of non-invasive ventilation. There'll also be secondary um, outcome measures. So this is ALS FRSR, um, and a, this is a lot of electri electrical tests that will be applied to different muscles. Um, I will point out that patients will, will then be offered at the conclusion of the six months, they'll be offered an OLE, which is an open label extension. So all patients will then um, be put on the active drug and then um, given the option to continue treatment for another um, uh, six months. We've got some exploratory endpoints there. I just want to mention that we will be examining we will be taking blood and urine samples, looking at the concentration of ambroxol, um, looking at target engagement. So does it does it hit the right enzyme, GBA2? Does it control, reconfigure the right lipids and fats in the blood? And also there's a couple of biomarkers. I think this audience will be very familiar with, with NFL um, as a biomarker of disease progression. So these are just some conclusions of what I'm showing today. We've shown you that um, there are quite profound lipid changes in a TDP43 mouse model, which is relevant to sporadic MND. And we're able to show that treatment with ambroxol, which is a generic drug, can improve multiple measures and indices in this mouse model. And we're really going to tease out whether ambroxol is effective for MND using this phase two trial, which will be completed in the next 12 months. And we believe strongly that ambroxol is a priority and promising agent to be repurposed for, for MND. So I'm just gonna close here by sh showing, um, there's our trial, it's up on clinicaltrials.gov. There is a lot of interest in ambroxyl for neurodegeneration at the moment, as you can see. I mentioned Parkinson's disease, but also other forms of dementia. Um, what's interesting is we've got five trials recruiting, three to recruit. I will point out that we have been talking and working closely with another organization called Cure Parkinson's in the UK. They're running a very large phase three trial of ambroxyl in Parkinson's disease. And what we're hoping is that we can align our phase two and ultimately our phase three with the timing of the phase three Parkinson's trial. Um, and that way, what we can do is present a united front when we approach drug companies in order to get um, licensing for ambroxyl for MND if it um, proves to be effective for MND. Um, I just wanted to close by acknowledging these two teams. So we've got the preclinical team. Most of the work I've presented today was generated by um, Sophia and also um, and Shu, our collaborator with the IPSC work. And of course, our collaboration with Jean-Philippe Loeffler and Michael Spedding. And then the clinical team, the clinical trial is could only be possible due to um, our, our top-notch top MND clinics. So Matthew Kim and Steve Vucic, Susan Mathers, David Schultz, and Laura Giles. And of course, um, the patients with MND, which make this trial possible. And all of this was enabled by funding by FIDMND, who funded both the preclinical and the clinical um, aspects of this work on Ambroxol. So thank you. I'll close there and hand back to Gethin. Right. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Rita, as well. That was um, a fantastic overview of uh, how we sort of start at the very early stages and then bring drugs through to trial. And look, should give a bit of a shout out there to Fight MND because it's their funding that is allowing um, some of the very early work that's been done to progress through into uh, actually getting it into patients, which is um, what we're all trying to do in the end. So um, that's awesome. I've got a few questions here. Um, I've got a question first for, for, for Rita. So interesting thing, I think Brad mentioned that 97% of patients have TDP43 pathology, and some of those 3% are actually the FUS patients. But you mentioned also, though, that FUS is found, is uh, misplaced in the cell as well, as well as TDP43. So is there any correlation between the pathology that drives disease because of FUS mutations and TDP43? Is there a, a relationship there, do you think? 
Um, so the FOS uh, pathology is not usually found in the the people with the TDP43 pathology. Mm -hmm. Is yep. that's what you said, right, Brad? That's right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Um, but there can there may still be a link between between the two because um, oftentimes the like for people with FOS mutations, you might get still be able to get some TDP43 pathology as well in that way. But uh, for the other way around, for the sporadic patients, uh, it's still still kind of up up in the air but there may be maybe some some interaction between them they both are involved in similar pathways in the cell like stress responses and things like that so they there could be some um, feedback between the two but it's still kind of under investigation is is my understanding of it okay and um you were saying one of the advantages of your uh, sort of um allele specific approach is you're not knocking down the kind of healthy protein um is there has there been evidence that then the uh, uh, other approaches where they knock down both alleles, they affect both the good and the bad protein? Are there toxic effects, or uh, do you think there is side effects to those approaches? Um, I think that it's likely for that gene that there there may be some side effects because, as I said, it's an RNA binding protein, so it affects the expression of uh, hundreds of other genes. Whereas for SOG1, for example, is is not uh, doesn't affect that many other genes directly. So if in that case, it's probably not as much of a problem. But I think for fuzz, um, the patients are quite young and they're probably going to be, hopefully, if the treatments work well, they might be taking the drug for a long time. So I just think it's important to kind of try and get the best the best outcome you can and avoid try and avoid uh, any other side effects by reducing the expression of the of the normal protein. Yeah. Look, and I think it's um it's good to have multiple um, uh, approaches for the same uh, same gene as such because uh, one competition drives uh, innovation and also helps eventually to drive down price because none of these drugs are going to be cheap when they come to come to patients. So I think the more options there are there, the um the the, the better it is for our, our patient population. Um, there's a couple of questions here came in, Brad, about um, which I'm sure you've probably fielded before about how come um, if ambroxyl has been around for a long time and it's already a, considered a safe drug, why can't it go to patients straight away, basically? Why can't it be prescribed for patients right now? Yes, I may not have mentioned this, but it's not available in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, nor, nor, nor the US. So uh, it, it's available in 70 countries. It's EMA approved. So um, yeah, look, patients certainly have the right to try and um, go about importing the drug via that, that route. I guess we didn't know definitively whether Ambroxol would work for MND until we put it through that pipeline of Petri dish models and, and animal models. Uh, because there have been many potentially um, promising drugs which have worked in a single mouse model of MND, but the real test here was getting it to work across um, multiple models. And I think especially the, the TDP43 mouse, which is quite, you know, very relevant to sporadic MND. So. Yeah, and I think... Um, this goes to another question we've got there about the wider challenge of um, why do we um, engage with long, potentially long-winded clinical trials when, um, uh, you know, perhaps patients don't have that time and they just um, should have the uh, uh, opportunity to take whatever treatment they think might work now. So, yeah, that's, um, that's why we have EAP. So I think I think there were a couple of patients on tofersin. Mm -hmm. um, before yeah. long before it was FDA approved. So I think that's a very important um, component. Yeah, so the extended access programs allow patients to keep taking the drug after the trial finishes. Mm. Some companies also run um, compassionate access programs as well. That's the one, yeah. Uh, where uh, even patients who might not be eligible for trial can still get access to the drugs. Mm. But the bigger question is why um, do we run trials like this? I think the... I mean, you, you can jump in as well, Brad, but I think the, the question is that we, we really need answers to the questions. Mm. You know, does this drug work? And I think that sometimes the problem if every patient is taking a, a different cocktail of drugs, it makes it very difficult to tell if a drug is actually helping the disease. One is that they can still be very toxic and they may interfere with other 
treatments you're having. So admittedly, it's frustrating, but I think we the, what everyone wants is really clean answers to questions. Is this drug going to work? Uh, is it worth paying? Um, and uh, it comes down to money, unfortunately, as well. These, these trials are very expensive to run. A company, most companies develop these drugs to make money. Um, uh, and uh, they want an answer to their questions too, as well as the patients. Patients want to know if the drug works. The company wants to know if the drug works. And then when they take it to say the PBS or the government to ask them to pay for a drug, a government won't pay for a drug unless they know it works. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it does come down to a business decision so, um, and some of these drugs are going to be are horribly expensive, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars. And it's very difficult then to, um, to justify that to a government when you say, we don't actually know if this drug works. Um, and I think that's, unfortunately, it comes down to a lot of it is business decisions. I don't know if uh, Rita or Brad, you want to add to that? I mean, Rita, you're right at the pointy end of this as well, with, um, I'm sure, trying to develop your drugs. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Uh, it, they do end up being quite expensive, but um, yeah, hopefully if, if you can get governments to pay for it, it should still be able to get access to the to the patients in the end. Yeah, so to add to you, Gethin, absolutely. The TGA won't be motivated by anything less than a gold standard clinical trial. So it has to have all of those, those properties. It has to be um, double blind, placebo controlled, you minimize exposure to placebo, which is why we've gone for a two to one randomization in this trial. Um, yeah, it, it really has to be, you need, really need a clean slate. So patients off any approved or um, non-approved medications um, and there's and the strict um, eligibility criteria as well for the trial. And this, this ensures that you get, you have, confidence in in if you detect a signal that um that 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 it's that it's pure you know it's not it's not due to any any noise or bias and that's what motivates the tda and the, and the law tga and the lawmakers um yeah exactly uh, just a, a quick question we had come in um and is the umbroxol you're using a um as an off the off the shelf or is it does it need to be modified for um for this application Yes, so the formulation we're using is more concentrated than what is off the shelf in Europe. So we did that in order to reduce um, the volume that pa patients would have to um, ingest. Um, so, it, it, yeah, different formulation, a bit more concentrated. Um, however, the active ingredient would be identical to what you would find in Europe. Um, we have a fairly uh, complex question here. I don't know if you can see it in the uh, in the Q and A there, Brad. Um, I don't know if I, I can read it out to you, but you oh. might want to read it yourself. So, given it is known PDA three in people with higher levels um, uh, of isoleucine creates toxicity to motor neurons because it depletes B twelve. So, should we be screening patients for PDIA three and isoleucine? and then treat them with a specific metabolite or gut bacteria to protect motor neurons. Is that, um, I've got no idea about that question. So does it make sense to you? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think there are some cases of B12 deficiency uh, that are linked to, linked to MND. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of that gene um, coming up in any genetic association studies. Um, and then treatment with isoleucine, so this is branched amino acids. I think I think AOS Untangled did a did an article actually on branch chain amino acids. So it might be worthwhile looking there to see if there's any any data or precedent to help um, address that question. Thank you. And um, one other comment we also had was about uh, Radicava or Adavarone is, is mm. now TGA approved. Mm. That, that is true. It has been approved by the TGA, but um they're now waiting to see whether it will be approved for um, reimbursement through the PBS. And the company who are going to be providing Radicava are saying they're not going to make it available until they get a decision about the reimbursement. And that is actually um, uh, an opportunity for me to spruik that um, this the, there is a, actually open to for submissions to the PBS at the moment. 
to support um, reimbursement for Edavarone. So uh, we're just getting up some information on our website. So if you go onto our website in the next uh, few days, there'll be some information telling you about how you can actually uh, make your own submission to the PBS to support reimbursement for Radicava, um, which will then hopefully mean it will be available at a, a very same price as uh, Ridizol for, for patients in Australia. We should absolutely all get behind that, yes. Yeah. Um, so there's no results yet, Brad, about um, Ambroxol and any, any other neurodegenerative diseases in clinical trials. There, uh, but yeah, look, there is for Parkinson's. So, yeah. so in that phase two paper that I, had, uh, I mentioned, they did get target engagement. So they did inhibit GBA activity in, I think it was um, brain fluid and blood. And they did um, correct that lipid uh, metabolism pathway. That trial wasn't powered for efficacy and Parkinson's, unlike MND, progresses quite slowly. So I guess we won't know. What's interesting is the, the phase three Parkinson's trial that I referred to won't be completed for another three or four years. So we should have data within 12 months in, in MND um, and, you know, pending the, the outcome there when it's all unblinded and so forth, we, we would then be armed um, to prepare for a phase three trial and have that running in conjunction with the, the, with the phase three Parkinson's trial. So this is really about joining forces with, um, with, with the Parkinson's community as well. So Ambroxol looks very promising there. Mm. And uh, is the um, Ambroxol um, being used in those other neurodegenerative diseases with the same idea that it targets, um, uh, sorry, what was the? Uh, GBA2. Pardon? GBA2? Yeah, GBA2, sorry. Yeah, yes. Um, so it's used, for, it's used for Lewy body dementia and um, Gaucher's disease. It's, it's the same mechanism of action, yes. Okay, cool. Yes. Well, let's, um, let's hope that uh, that comes through, and it'll mm. be, uh, uh, be a lot more power to approvals if it can be approved across a number of different. Um, That's right. Diseases as well. That's right. Um, it's a question for for both of you. Just the last question to finish up. So you both mentioned the power of um, doing some of the earlier studies in human derived stem cells, iPSCs, neurons, etc. Is it, do you think the um, field is moving a bit more towards relying on data from these human derived cells rather than from mouse models, given that there, there's probably been quite a run of uh, a lack of success in converting mouse model outcomes to human patients? Do you feel that perhaps iPSCs and these human derived cells are the, the way of the future? Um, well, I kind of hope so, because a lot of the things that I'm working on are there are no appropriate mouse models or they're very hard to make and they're not quite right for purpose. So it actually makes a lot more sense to, to do it in iPSC derived um, motor neurons. And um, it may make my life a lot easier if that data was uh, accepted uh, in, without having to do mouse models for everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I always say no model is perfect and you probably should embrace them all if you can, if you're, you know, if your research budget allows, and that's what we did with Ambroxol. We put it through, you know, every every system we could in order to be confident um, in our preclinical package to take it forward. So I, I would say um, use both uh, wisely, mm -hmm. the, the human and the mouse, the animal models. All right. Well, thank you both. We're, uh, we're, we've reached the end of our time. So thank you again for uh, excellent insights into um, the drug development process and uh, some of the... Uh, the challenges as well that we, we face about uh, developing these new drugs. Um, for those watching tonight, um, everyone receives a link to the recording. Please feel free to distribute this across your networks so as many more people as you can can really appreciate the uh, fantastic research that's happening in Australia in the M&D space. Um, and you can access this and our previous editions on our M&D Australia webpage. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel that all these videos are on. Um, uh, we also have uh, our research directions come uh, that's just come out today, actually, just an update on our um, on research advances in the world. So um, that's all for tonight. Again, thank you, Brad and Rita. Really appreciate your time tonight. And um, uh, good night to everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you.
think so.